took me about six weeks to get well. I started making knives, and then the local uh, TV station come out there and done an article on me, and I started selling knives right and left. And then Florida State Wildlife Magazine I have right here, they done an article on me. And I was going up and down the side of the railroad track, old St. Mark's railroad track, it had been abandoned, picking up these railroad spots. My railroad spot knives got fairly popular. And I'd about picked them all up, and they was tearing that, that track up, going to make a bike trail out of it. So I went to the contractor. He was just going to junk them railroad spikes. I gave him $150 for two pickup truckloads of them. So I had enough railroad spikes to last me. Matter of fact, I still got about 30 or 40,000 left. <laughs> I don't think I'll be making that many knives. But anyway, uh, Florida Wildlife Magazine done that article on me, and it, I didn't know that people in Germany and Switzerland and everywhere subscribed to that magazine, but they did. And I started getting orders from all over the world, making railroad spike knives. And it wasn't very long. Every time I looked at a railroad spike, I got an upset stomach. <laughs> I didn't care much for railroad spikes. To begin with, a railroad spike is low carbon steel. Make a beautiful knife. And they'll hold a decent edge, but they won't hold an edge like a good high carbon steel knife would. This is a piece of high carbon, real good piece of steel. And people out here that don't know much about knives, just because it's shiny and somebody says stainless steel, that's, in a good knife maker's viewpoint, that's not a very good knife. A very good knife is dark steel, which is high carbon. That's what your good knives are made out of. But anyway, everything just started blossoming, and I, I felt I was selling knives here and there and doing some shows and getting quite a few collectors around, and a fellow told me, he says, man, he says, you need to go to, uh, I was making a lot of tomahawks, and y'all would be surprised at the number of people that collects tomahawks. And another thing, too, y'all wouldn't, probably wouldn't know it, but to an outdoorsman, a tomahawk's probably the most valuable tool he'll ever own. I'll use a tomahawk probably two to one over a knife now. I'm going to use Tommy Hawk generally every day for something. But anyway, uh, talked me into going to a, a muzzle loading rendezvous, and that's where you, people dress up in the buckskin clothes and stay in the white tents and cook on open fires and stuff for like a week or two at a time and have to live the 1850 time period of life for a week or two and sell your products where people with all the furs would come and people with leather and come and the and the box makers and the candle makers and spoon makers and every kind of old smith that you didn't think was still smithing, doing some type of smith work, leather smiths and stuff, they'd all showed up at rendezvous. You'd go to rendezvous and buy stuff you can't find at Walmart. You know, this uh, stuff, crafts you thought was gone and lost, they're still around. You just have to go to a muzzleloading rendezvous to find them. Another thing I'd like to emphasize, you can't find them things out of powwows. I don't do powwows. The reason I don't do powwows is because it hurts my heart to see, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but see the white man's greed butcher up my craft for profit. And that's what they do. They butcher up my people's craft for profit. In other words, stainless steel dream catchers and stuff like that. You know, a dream catcher can only be made out of grapevine and willow. And that's the only two plants allowed in a dream catcher. And to a dream catcher to a Cherokee Indian, is nothing like it, what it is to a Western Indian. To a Cherokee Indian, it's it's a, a, the girls, the only one that had them, and it was their hope chest. She'd start dating, and a boy would give her a bead or something, and she'd sew it into a dream catcher. Another boy might give her a feather, and she'd sew it in a dream, dream catcher. She'd look at that and figure out who she's going to marry in life. And that's what it was to the Eastern, the Cherokee Indians. But to the Western Indians, it was an entirely different thing. But anyway, it was really butchered up my people's craft. and. Rondi, muzzle loading rendezvous, everything had to be authentic. Couldn't have stainless steel at a rendezvous because it wasn't invented in 1850 or 1840. Couldn't have a kerosene lamp because that wasn't invented until the Civil War. So everything had to be authentic. You couldn't have stainless steel knives. Couldn't have no knives with no plastic. To this very day, I don't put no plastics in any of my handle. You look at that knife right there, it looks like a plastic handle, but that's buffalo horn right there. And that's buffalo horn. This is my carta, and what my carta is is cloth. It's cloth and resin, cloth and resin, cloth and resin. There's no plastic in it. That's a piece of elk horn. 
but anyway, everything's authentic. And uh, that's what I like to use in all my knives. And uh, just about talked myself away here and just about forgot where I was at. Somebody informed me, where was I at? 